How are you this morning? Well, what a great couple of weeks, weekends we've had in the last two weekends. Have you noticed at all that there's an awful lot about fire? I mean, like we watched uh, Sunday two weekends ago about Patricia King and the XP, um, the fire DVD. She talked about the second baptism of the Holy Spirit is, you know, be baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire and there was a she presented this amazing teaching of how there's an expectation of fire breaking out all around the world and and then we've had Lauren Cunningham in weeks past and he would certainly agree with that whole sentiment and then of course last weekend we had Bill and Judith Tartana because we were celebrating Pentecost which is when the Spirit of God came and anointed disciples with tongues of Fire. How many of you would have loved to have been there at that time? That must have been an amazing time. And anybody goes off speaking in other languages, that would be absolutely fun. This is a random thought, but has any of you ever tried using your tongues when you're walking through an international airport? It's quite fun, actually. That's completely off the subject, but it doesn't really matter. Just using those tongues that, that, that God has given us. Well, this morning, it really got me thinking about fire. There's such been such an emphasis on fire. And if we look, Josh, if we can put up that fire triangle. Um, any of you who have done fire and service education at your place of work would be very familiar with the fire triangle because, of course, these are the elements that you need to have fire go. You need heat, you need fuel, and you need oxygen. They need to be in the right proportions. Because if you don't have any one of those, if any one of those is missing, you're not going to have fire. Now, we know that fire is quite dramatic. If you live in Australia, especially around the southeast border or, around, or up in Queensland, over the summer, there is huge fear of fire because it spreads and it jumps. And suddenly you can lose whole communities just with one spark of fire. It can take it. It's incredibly if you like, contagious, to use a medical term. And fire can just take hold, and once it gets to a certain tipping point, it's very, very hard to take off. It got me wondering, all these spots of fire that are breaking up around the world, if you were the enemy, how would you feel about all these bits of Holy Spirit fire breaking out all around the world? How would you feel about it? I don't know whether they've got sirens, whether there's fire spots in hell, and whether they, where they try and douse the hot spot. I don't know. Well, that's pathetic. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Ah, <laughs> 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 oh, more hot spots. You got your work cut out for you. Come on. Come on. Hurry up. Come on. Think of the punishment you'll get if you don't get those hot spots. Hurry up. Come on, come on, put your back to it, break it, come on. There's far too many hotspots around the world. You, oh my goodness, I'm not sure about you guys. I think we have to line up some punishment for you. Well, I really don't know whether it's like that in hell or not, but I'm sure the enemy is on high alert because he wants to dampen down any hot spots that are coming around the world because, of course, it is so uh, contagious. How do you dampen down hot spots who are Christians? How do you dampen down the passion and the enthusiasm that is part of a Christian normal lifestyle? How do you make that? How do you reduce that? Let me give you a couple of suggestions or one of the very effective ways that the enemy will dampen down hot spots. And the first one 
is offence. Now, Jesus had no problem offending people. Rachel read out one this morning and talked about, unless you eat my blood or drink my, uh, eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can't enter the kingdom of God. And people, his desire, people got offended and they left. And he didn't explain himself to them. Do you notice that? He didn't explain himself. He offended the Samaritan, uh, the Pharisees, left, right, and center. And he would say things deliberately to provoke them. And he would challenge their beliefs, challenge their worldviews, challenge the way that they judge and critic, critique people. He challenged them right to the core. He made no apologies. He offended the Samaritan woman. He called her a dog. That's hardly very complimentary. I'm sure he said it with a twinkle of his eye, but nonetheless, she could have taken offense, and he didn't pull back from that. But what happened? She looked at the heart. She didn't look at the words. And so often when God in our lives, we can be offended by God. He doesn't explain things to us. He actually doesn't have to. He is God after all. But in our mind and in our thinking, we want to understand before we will give him our honor and our obedience. Yes, Jesus does offend us. Yes, he does at times. And we can easily be offended by God. Eric Johnson, Bill Johnson's brother, is deaf in both ears. And his son, is it? And yet... He has an amazing, miraculous ministry. He prays for people, and they, they get healed from astonishing things. And he's deaf in both ears. And yet he's determined, I will not get offended at a God. I refuse to allow my deafness to cause me to draw back an offense. I refuse to do that. I refuse not to get offended. Another area that can dampen down Christians, and you see this again and again, the body of Christ, is a whole issue of unforgiveness. When people say things and we get hurt and we, get, we draw back, uh, we can become a prisoner in the realms of our own unforgiveness. And I'm continually astonished as to the levels of unforgiveness, how it can personally impact on our bodies and in the way that our health progresses. It is absolutely astonishing. Unforgiveness can be pushed in under layers and layers of denial. And as we journey in, the, in our walk with the Lord, as he takes us through and brings up areas of unforgiveness that we never even knew that were in there. Sometimes we, we're asked to forgive people for things that can never be repaid to us. It could be that you may have the opportunity to forgive your mum and dad for your lost childhood. That is a debt that can never be repaid. But as in the parable of the unforgiving servant, when he chose not to forgive, unless we do it, we too can end up in prison, tormented by our own thinking and our own thoughts that can hold us in prison just as effectively as any bars can. You know, when we uh, refuse to forgive, it gives the enemy legal right to harass us. It's like you open the door, say, welcome in, do your best. And we give him that legal right. And unless we release those who have offended us with forgiveness, we're not going to get out of it. The only way if someone's got you in a judo hold where you cannot get out of it is you tap out. And when we tap out of the devil's hold by forgiveness, we are the ones that get, out, get the hook out of us. It's not that we let the perpetrator off the hook. I mean, if he needs justice, he needs to face the law system, yes. But when we forgive, we get the hook out of us. There are many Christians, and it saddens us, that we see again and again that they refuse to forgive. And they continue to hold the offense. It's like they take the poison and wait for the other person to die. It doesn't work that way. And sometimes, for, and please hear me, I'm not minimizing unforgiveness. I'm not minimizing the pain that some of us have to go through. But what I'm saying is when you get to the end of your level of forgiveness, 
and we all have levels. But when you get to it, often the barrier that's still there is a sense of our own hurt and perhaps bewilderment or confusion. It's just giving that to Jesus, not only forgiving that, sometimes it just might be words, I forgive, and then hand over your hurt and the pain and the shame and the embarrassment, whatever it was, just hand that over. Exchange it, whatever you do, exchange it. Don't leave it at the cross, pick up the exchange. That's your right. Exchange it. And then if there's no sense of release, you say, God, I need your forgiveness because I've used up all mine. And allow his forgiveness to flow out of you. You've got Christ in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. If anyone knows about forgiveness, it's Christ in you. He's forgiven the whole world for everything. And as you forgive, let his forgiveness come out of you. You can sense a release from that, and it will bring you out of being smothered in that damp spot by unforgiveness. That, that is, and, and you allow the passion, the passion of the knowledge of Jesus just to fill that area up. And allow that flame to ignite again. That's, um, that's very good. And then, of course, flames need fuel. And any good fireman would know that any time that, that you're, um, there's a fire, if there's wood on fire, scatter the fire. Spread it out. So the fuel <laughs> is removed. <laughs> oh, I think we'll have to have a few more whippings when you get back home. <laughs> Don't take him away. <laughs> you know, you spread out the source of the fire. And I'm sure the enemy, when he looks at hot spots around the world, he's looking for the source of the hot, that, that, the source of the hot spot, the source of the fire. And he will do anything to separate out that source so it can't ignite. It's like what Ian spoke this morning about the coal. The coal needs a sense of community to really flame. Otherwise, if it's by itself, it will gradually weaken and dim and go out. And so the enemy is looking around for the source of the hot spot. How does he dampen down? How does he remove the source of the fuel amongst Christians who get it collectively uh, display the goodness of God? Religion is a great way of doing that. When religion comes in and clamps his hold on you, religion is trying to do things by tradition and ritual and earn the right to be in good relationship with God, which is God's just gift to us. Religion will keep us separate. Religion will cause us to judge others. Religion will give, um, is pretty heavy on punishment. You know, if you don't do this, this is going to happen, and my goodness, and that will happen, and you're done. And there's not a grace that goes with it. Religion will isolate Religion holds you outside of the grace of God. Religion is a slave driver. Where things got to be done right, and they've got to be done proper, and they've got to be done my way, often. <laughs> Religion will isolate you. And, you know, Jesus confronted um, the re religiousness of the Pharisees day after day after day. Religion will separate you out from the body of Christ. Um, it's so funny when... Jesus was right with all the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and they had studied all about the life of the Messiah. They knew it up to here. They knew the word, the Logos word. They knew it. They could quote it ad infinitum. And they memorized huge big chunks. I think most of the Old Testament they'd memorized. They knew it up to here. 
But when the Word became flesh, John 1, about 6, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The living Word, the rhema, was right in front of them and they didn't recognize it. Religion will stop you recognizing the living Word. You know, we can worship the Bible, the Bi- and please hear me, I'm not knocking the Bible, I love the Bible, but it is the Word the Logos word of God. The rhema word is the, the relationship with Jesus. It's flesh, it's alive, it's active, it's sharp, it's two-edged. It's powerful. It's powerful. Religion will keep you separated uh, from that hot spot. And also independence. You often see it with prophetic people. You know, they get hurt, they're misunderstood, so they isolate themselves from the body of Christ. Just withdraw. Just, and, and sometimes it's a safety issue, just putting boundaries up, but there becomes an independent thing inside. Well, it's only me and Jesus, and that's all we need. It's, we can manage just me and Jesus. I don't need all those people. And that independence can grow, and it isolates us. You know, if you've got a prophetical uh, gift, you are much better to prophesy in the context of a corporate gathering with, with your cell groups, that sort of thing. Place where people know you and understand and you have context. But often people who kind of come around, and they've got a prophetic word for Invercarg or whatever, we think, okay, where are you joined into? What body are you representing? If there's no kind of kind of connection with the body they're immediately suspect because you you know they're just lone rangers doing their own thing and sure they may have a very good word of God but because they are not part of the body you kind of hold their revelation you hold it apart you know we are designed to be a part of a body the orphans have been adopted in And when we try and go it alone with just me and Jesus, we miss what God has hidden in the body for us to develop because we're not designed to go it alone. We miss out on what God has for us because um, he hides things in the body to teach us that we're not meant to go alone, that we need each other. We are interdependent, not independent. So that's a couple, that's a fuel, and that's a heat. And the last thing that the enemy would try to do is to restrict oxygen. Oxygen. very cooperative, aren't they? <laughs> can you give it back to him so I can try it with someone else? <laughs> there we are. Oh, oh my goodness. Yeah, there we are. All right, fire blanket. Very effective up there. <laughs> He's trying to smother life. He tries to smother life. He tries to stifle. Carbon dioxide does the same thing. You know, it just smothers out the fire and stops it from flaming. How does the enemy try to smother the life that is within us? He has a number of ways according to how we are wired personally. But one of his primary smothering blankets if you, to use those terms, is that of fear. Fear is common to every one of us. And fear will smother our faith in Jesus. Fear is actually just having faith in the devil. Fear is actually choosing to believe that the enemy has more power over our lives than God has. Fear is actually choosing to align with his perspective of our life rather than believe what God is. That's all fear is. Every one of us has fear, and sometimes fear can drive us. And even when we get healing from fear, 
that does not mean to say that you will never have fear again. No, that's not right. You will have fear because fear is a natural body response. It protects us. Standing on the edge of the cliff, you might feel a slight trepidation. That's a normal, healthy fear. Don't go any further or you'll learn all about gravity. It's a normal, healthy fear. But when you're absolutely driven by fear, that is abnormal and it needs healing. The enemy, the only power that the devil has over us is the authority we give him because we're set free. And when we give the enemy authority and we give it, Perhaps not consciously, but we actually do. We give him that authority. How do we do that? By agreeing with his lies. He is the father of lies. He is the father of lies. All his demonic hordes will whisper lies into you. And when we agree, it takes hold. We we open the door to give him power in our life. When we grow, we, as we grow up, we have woundings that come in our lives. No one lives in a perfect world. Every one of us gets wounded. The enemy will sow lies into those wounds, and they will grow and become strongholds. When we continue to agree with the lies, it's like a link in a chain that binds us. And it's getting God's perspective on those lies that will set us free. It's God has given us the ability to break those lies off us, but we've got to choose. We've got to choose to, to have those lies broken off us. You know, the enemy, our body, a normal healthy body will repel germs. You know, germs come and go. We live in a germ-laden atmosphere, and normally our bodies just throw them off and affect us no, not at all. And it's the same with our spiritual body. It has a, an inherent capacity to repel the enemy's germs. What are the enemy's germs? Lies. Lies. But if we choose not to, uh, to agree with the enemy's lies, to agree with the enemy's perspective of our situation, those lies take hold and grow into our and grow and get bigger and bigger and the effect is more and more pronounced but we are made to repel lies and there's many of us we live under lies and if you're to look at them in the light of God's uh, gaze and actually look at them you actually see actually how stupid and preposterous they are and to see in the realm of the spirit and I think that's why the enemy is so against people seeing in the realm of the spirit. Because if you can actually see in the spiritual realm some of the spiritual forces that are around about us, every one of us has got to protect an angel. Every one of us. We've got angels. So immediately you double the number of beings in this building right now because every one of us has got at least one angel. There's a huge big guardian angel up there. I've seen it a number of times. And on Thursday night, I was last hour of the building. I came down through here. It was all dark. I had my phone on for a light. And I went over, and that exit light was on, and it was so bright. I thought, flip, is there a light on out there? And I came up through the stage, and immediately I was conscious of this huge guardian angel just right up there looking over the drums, Stephen. You know, just very, very conscious in there. And many times during a service, I'm conscious of entities around. Usually we don't see that because we've not trained our eyes to see it. We've not opened our eyes to see it. We're not aware of it. But we can. We just ask the Lord, show me. And then just go with the the impressions that you have. Um, But if we could see in the realm of the Spirit and see the amazing, phenomenal protection that God has put around us. And it would just bring such a deep, security and a safety into our spirit that we'd never need to be afraid. If you're struggling with fear this morning, I want to encourage you every day, read Psalm 91. Every day, read it out loud and ask the Lord to show you what it means. It's a psalm of protection. It is absolutely brilliant. And actually, when you take through and study it, it, it covers every fear 
available to mankind, every fear. And so just knowing that we have that level of protection is just amazing. I wonder if the musos would like to come, please. I want to encourage you, you know, in some areas where there are fire, um, fire goes underground. It goes underground. Some of the marsh areas around the fire that we had out at Ararua a couple of years ago, it's huge. And there'd be hot spots even now, still there, underground, waiting for the right circumstances, fuel, oxygen, heat to reignite. And it's certainly been true in China, the nation of China, Whereas Lauren Cunningham talked about how he believes that within 10 years, China will reach a tipping point. And that um, he believes that the prosperity is more about the Christians rising up in the nation of China than rather what's been um, their financial situation, really just as good financial decisions. I want to invite you this morning to be a spiritual arsonist. <laughs> I want to invite you to be the devil's worst nightmare. <laughs> Why not? Don't light fires. Don't light fires. Now, I've never actually purposely lit a fire, but I do understand it's quite addictive. I mean, apart from the one and the where you're meant to light them. But I understand you know, like in the fire grate. But I understand um, it can get quite addictive. And, you know, there are stories of firemen who suddenly go, oh, you know, who light fires and hope not to get discovered. The devil's worst nightmare. Every one of you has got the capacity to light fires. Every one of you, it's your inherent nature. And just, just let it out. Let the God out. Just let it out. Deal with your stuff. And I recognize now also too that in the intervening couple of weeks that the enemy has been doing his work because, of course, he doesn't want that fire to go. And I recognize that he will try and smother your relationship. I recognize that he'll try and take the heat out of your passion and that he'll try and isolate you from others. Because that's what the enemy does. His mandate is to steal, kill, and destroy. And he doesn't change. But our God doesn't change either. He's loving. He's full of kind, compassion and kindness. He's slow to anger. He's forgiving. He's merciful. He's faithful. And he doesn't change. No matter what you do, he just doesn't change. And so we have got great confidence just coming. And I want to invite you just to stand this morning. I want to invite you to stand. And I want to invite you just to lift your hands. And you might want to feel, you know, just as we kind of consider what some of, I want you to consider your fire, your own personal fire. How bright is it? Has it been flaming? Or has the enemy of our souls managed to dampen it down a bit? And there's no shame. Jesus, God doesn't condemn. He just said Jesus. He doesn't condemn. There's no condemnation with God. And I want to just invite you, you know, if you are identified with perhaps one of those areas that I mentioned this morning that the enemy would use. I want to invite you just to let it, um, just to uh, release that. If you're offended, release it for your sake. If you're offended at God, I encourage you, take a leaf out of Eric Johnson's book. God, I don't understand, but actually I don't need to. Because you're God and I'm not. If you find that you've um, been dampened down by things, ask God what you need to do. If there's an independence in you, I encourage you, change your mind. We need each other. We actually need each other. 
And if there's religion in you, ask God, God, is it religious? Have I got a religious mindset? God, please, can you help me with that? And if there's fear, oh, God understands. He so understands. Ask him for a revelation of his goodness and his protection. Father, we stand before you this morning as your sons and daughters and we recognize that at times we allow the enemy far too much access in our life because we agree with his lies. And so we lift our hands to you this morning and we ask you, Father, to cleanse us and restore us. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you will blow on everybody here blow over their lives, blow that flame into fresh energy. Blow it up so there's a fresh conflagration that it it blows up. That there's a sense of your oxygen going in and feeding the fire, your Holy Spirit fire. That your glory would be evident. That you would display your amazing greatness. And what the enemy went to take us out God, you will use it to display more your glory. We thank you, Father, for your protection. Thank you for your goodness. It never changes. And we thank you for the confidence that you will, even though bad things can happen, you will always be there and you will take us through it that we can walk out in total victory. And so we bless you. We bless you. We thank you, God. I want you just, come on, folks, can you just lift your hands and thank him? He's faithful. Thank you, God. You never change. You're amazing. You're full of grace, full of compassion. You're so reliable. I can trust you. You're so predictable. So, so, so understanding. We bless you now. We bless you now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It's the book of Romans that says it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. And, um, you know, just uh, that, that scripture's been running through my heart in the last uh, 10 minutes. And um, you feel that, there's people here who feel that God's not kind. Or he's not kind to you. And uh, I just want to, just in these last moments that we have, come on, just be aware of the kindness of God. It's the kindness of God that the, when he called a Samaritan woman, a dog, was the kindness of God that addressing disciples and say, drink my blood, offensive to the Jewish, absolutely offensive. It's the kindness of God telling a religious leader, that he needs to start all over again, needs to be born again. It's the kindness of God, because the kindness of God wrecks who we are, tampers with our structures. I had a feeling this morning God's been tampering with structures. And so as we close this morning, I invite you to give your heart to Jesus. I invite you to come and say, Lord, have my life. We did this at the start, but now with all of the revelation that we have and of the kindness, people's fires have gone out. You know, we rushed around with fire blankets and fire extinguishers or water, all of those kind of things, removing people and all of those kind of things. But suddenly there's a, in the, in the humor of that, we recognize that in our humani- humanity, that's exactly what's happened. And so, Holy Spirit, I want to thank you that you're here. And we come and we thank you for the kindness of God that's ministered. Your kindness that came to this earth and redeemed. Wonderful, Jesus. Lord, we think of our land, our nation. At this Christmas, we will celebrate the gospel being in this nation for 200 years. Lord, never let that fire go out. In fact, Lord, we pray that the fire would come again. 
in Jesus' name. In our communities, in the small towns and villages and hamlets and cities of our great nation. A little nation. Tucked away at the bottom of the world. But a prophetic sound would rise up out of this nation. I want all of the prophetic people here this morning, I want you to lift your hands right now. You know who you are. That just rung like a ring in a bell when I said the word prophetic. And I want you to lift your hands. And Father, in the name of Jesus, I release your warriors in Jesus' name. I release the fire blanket that's been on them. I release that that's been on them. That they would operate in that. Shannon, it's coming off you. It's coming off you. The structures that are being, I see this, that's being deconstructed all around you right now. Things are peeling off. And that which God has built in secret will be blazed the light will be set on a hill, a city that cannot be hidden. That's your destiny, girl. That's your destiny. That's your destiny. David and Karen, you know, I love that you struggled with the fire blanket. I love that. Because that's not just wasn't an act. That's you. That is you. That was a prophetic act. We will not have that on our lives. And Lord, I just, just lift your hands for a moment, both of you. And Father, I honor these two. I, want to, I just pray right now, Father, let your glory rest on them, on their girls. And Father, that that blanket will not come near their house. Amen. At, at any point, Lord, I just pray, increase the fire. Turn it up. Turn up the thermostat. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Sandy Tucky, look at you up there with your hands lifted up and the fire, all I see up there in that corner is the fire of God. And just lift your hands again, Father. Grab Paul too. Help him. Help, and, uh, <laughs> Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I bless this family. Great kids, great family. And Father, I want to thank you for them, that the fire of your presence, the gloriousness of your presence would rest on them in a new and a fresh way. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. This couple right up the back here, I don't know you, but hi there. And Father, right now, just lift your hands. Father, right now, I thank you in Jesus' name. I can't actually see up that far. So, uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless them. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God's increasing your borders and your boundaries. What He's doing is He's beginning to stretch areas in your lives. And uh, in the process of doing that, things you think get torn away but what there's doing God is building a fresh resilience into your life he's building something in that will last for much longer than you think it will and uh, there's an establishment of purpose there's an establishment and a desire from the very throne room of God that you would know what it is to be planted and you would know what it is to grow and flourish in Jesus name thank you Lord thank you Jesus thank you Jesus Sheila Ramabaka Sabramabaka Maria Shabrosana. Thank you, Lord. Woo! You know, right around our nation, um, you know, here a couple of weeks ago, we had 38 kids give their hearts to the Lord. Um, right around um, the nation, you need to know that news agencies are now starting to ask the question of young people just in our own movement, just in our own movement. Reggie Dabbs was on Television One breakfast show the other day because over two and a half thousand kids gave their hearts to Christ in the last month. And, uh, and so that's been, there's a, there's, a, there's a critical mass that's coming. There's a, there's a tipping point that's coming. And we need to be aware of that, just as the enemy is moving in Iraq at the moment, and the, the jihadists have moved on a town you may not realize, but the town of Mosul has fallen. And that is the old city of Nineveh. And there has been, that has been a Christian conclave since Jonah was sent there. It's always been Christian. And, uh, and, and they've targeted that one specifically, and they have killed everyone that they can find. And there are cries coming out of the Middle East, friends of mine in the Middle East right now, that this is an incredible conflict. We are tucked away and we miss it, but we need to pray for the Christians in Iraq and in Iran and in Syria. We need to pray for that area, the Middle East, uh, in, the, in, the, in Israel, of course, as well. You just need to pray that uh, as God begins to move in these days and that the enemy will move as well. But where evil abounds, but where evil abounds, someone help me, but where evil abounds, grace abounds all the more. 
Amazing grace. The Lord bless you this morning. Come on, we're going to finish with this great song. And uh, we're going to get some tea and some coffee. And uh, I'm on tonight. I'm looking forward to that already. Habasha.